Since ancient times, there have been reported sightings of strange creatures, shadows, which appear in places such as dark rooms, basements, old homes, historical sites, and deep in the forest. These beings have been the speculation of possession and demonic attacks, suggesting an evil presence that is able to move in and out of this world. But what are these strange creatures? Where do they come from and what function do they serve? If mankind had its genesis in the Garden of Eden, a story closely linked with the legend of Hyperborea, located at the North Pole, where the northern lights bleed out from, then is it possible that these beings, designated as ghosts, shadows, or demons, originate in the same place? Have they been entering our world through the aurora? The auroras are a beautiful spectacle to be observed. It is the reminder of the zero point of Earth's magnetic structure. But what if the aurora had a dual function? Could the aurora be the projector of all that seems to plague humanity in an attempt to return back to the original state before the fall of man, before the genie was released from the bottle? Truth is often hidden in plain sight using music, movies, culture. When we think of ghosts, we often have this image that they are white or they wear white sheets. But in the quintessential tale Ghostbusters, there's a ghost, Slimer, who is obviously emerald in color, a plasmatoid ghost who is fought with electric power and plasma. Ghostbusters 2 reveals this emerald color in conjunction with the ghost realm as well. When this deep emerald color appears, as it's been shown in many movies, we're dealing with a force that represents the nature of existence, the aurora borealis, and a type of enchantment which leads us to the north. Could it be that the emerald energy of the heart of Earth has been broadcasting ghouls? Shadow creatures or shadow people are also known as shadow ghosts, shadow figures, or shadow men. They are supernatural entities, mostly with humanoid form, which, according to reports, are seen mostly by peripheral vision during the hypogenetic state, which is the state between being awake and sleeping. Although there are also reports of people who have seen them directly and even attacked by these strange and mysterious creatures. They are considered in the paranormal culture as specific types of malicious and stealthy spirits. Mainstream science has attempted to explain the phenomena of shadow people by denouncing them as optical illusions hallucinations brought about by psychological circumstances like sleep paralysis or even by the phenomenon known as pareidolia. However, there are plenty of scientists, scholars and spiritualists who believe these strange beings belong to a parallel dimension, to that existing inner realm and that they are ancient able to penetrate our world by traveling through time-space faults. Accounts of these beings are not only in present times. In fact, the first cases reported in the manuscripts were found in abbeys of the 4th century. Japanese scholars label these beings the Yurei. The Middle Ages called them Sokibi, or the Sokibus, and the rabbit tales speak of the Karina. Many people today are engaged in the investigation of the paranormal and many of them claim after their conclusions about shadow people that they have a common behavior. They move quickly around the observer or remain static at their sight, most often causing a feeling of fear and paralysis. Among the various types of shadow creatures already reported are those known as the hooded figure and the hat man.
According to the Judeo-Christian belief, these encounters can be explained by the tale of angels and demons, who fight an ongoing battle behind the scenes of existence. Interestingly, angels and demons were at first the same thing. Beings of light were endowed with the attributes we label as dark, such as pride, hate and fear. The tale suggests when humans came into existence, certain angels considered it a threat to their superiority and a rebellion occurred. The angels who went against the will of God became hateful, and they were led by one called Lucifer. This is where the idea of fallen angels come from. In psychology, one of the most well-known concepts is that of projection. This is when the human ego defends itself against unconscious impulses or qualities, both negative and positive, by denying their existence in themselves while attributing them to others. During projection, we are essentially taking what's within and observing it without through our own biases and judgments. We can draw the connection between psychological projection and the hermetic law of as within, so without. The whole concept is, if we can realize the wisdom in the idea of the Tao, of the One, that a unified consciousness displays to us all shades of its qualities, while the shades themselves appear separate, then we can grasp projection in a more multidimensional sense. One consciousness broken into two. This is what angels and demons seem to suggest. After all, the light and dark need each other like the black and white squares on a game board, a Masonic symbol we are constantly shown. We are reminded of the Carl Jung quote, How can I be substantial if I do not cast a shadow? I must have a dark side also if I am to be whole. Could it be that the biblical rebellion against God is a metaphor revealing that a consciousness itself, the same consciousness which inhabits human bodies during this experience, fell into a war within its own mind? If you are a fractal of the universe, a microcosm of the macrocosm, then the war within can be seen as the war without, and vice versa. So if a human mind can project evil onto others, as explained in psychology, then it makes sense that a universal mind could project so-called evil into itself. After defeat, the fallen angels were punished to live in a dimension of darkness, known to us as Hell or Hades. Demonology and the Ars Goetia of Solomon explain a set of demons that are said to rule the hellish realm, able to bleed into the earth. It describes how these beings can turn into shadows to camouflage themselves from the human eye. This is similar to the theme of Archons in the Gnostic traditions, where a group of spiritual parasites are said to move in and out of the world to do the Demiurge's bidding. In Asia, more specifically in Japan, the stories of ghosts or spirits are part of the country's folklore, heavily rooted in Japanese culture. And although the culture is quite unknown in the West in respect to this subject, we found a surprising connection of the tales with the auroras. As we know, there are two types of auroras, one to the north and one to the south, Borealis and Australis, respectively. Australis shares a phonetic connection with astral, which is a field often associated with stellar voyages through meditation and other practices. And although this connection is obvious, we had not found one with the word Borealis, at least until now. The name commonly used for ghosts in Japan, again, is Yurei. The name consists of two kanji, Yu 
meaning faint or dim, and re, meaning soul or spirit. But there is an alternative name that links with the aurora at the north called bore, which in Japanese means ruined or departed spirit. Bore is also found in the Italian dictionary, which the plural form becomes the word borea, that means a cold or northerly wind. According to Japanese folklore, the yure or bore are traditionally female. They wear white fluttering clothes, kimonos, robes, or long cloaks. Sometimes the face remains transfigured in an expression of pain, fear, or despair, from which the yure cannot dissociate itself. The face is like a wax mask, transfixed into a stony expression of horror, and when seen for the first time, causes shock and revulsion. They are able to walk on the ceiling or walls. They can move very quickly, turning into a blur as they cross distances in the blink of an eye. According to the folklore, the yure comes from a violent death charged with powerful emotions, especially murders and suicides. If a soul becomes obsessed with hatred, suffering, or jealousy, it's said that it can cross back the portal that divides the material world from the spiritual, becoming a yure. It is interesting to note that in these descriptions, the female figure is always demonized. In the same way, we find a parallel with the story of the Garden of Eden, where, according to legend, the woman Eve is responsible for luring Adam to eat the forbidden fruit, resulting in their expulsion from paradise. We mentioned Hyperborea at the beginning of this video. Hyperborea means beyond Boreas, or the Borealis, suggesting the center holds the keys past this cold wind of demons, a projected fallen consciousness. One of the most famous portraits of a Yure, or Bore, is found in the 2002 film The Ring, where the ghost comes out of the water well. The representation of the girl coming out of the water hole may be indicative of the fact that these spirits enter our dimension through the auroras in the north. For years, we have been explaining that the central north houses the black sun, and that the auroras are expelled from there, similar to a nuclear reactor. The center is often described as the cauldron of the mother goddess in Celtic mythology. So it is no surprise that in the ring, this analogy is recreated by the ghost coming out of the water pit, or the figure of the black sun with the ring in the various presentation covers of the film. Like the bore in the ring, the shadows and spirits come out of the well of the subconscious of the black sun. We fight with the shadows that are a part of our own creation, a part of our own being. It's evident we've been looking at ghouls, shadows, and demonic forces as separate from the self, when perhaps they are nothing more than a reflection of a dualistic paradigm, maintaining suppression and a lack of integration of that which we call dark. The name of the ring's ghost is Samara, a name strikingly similar to Samsara, referring to the cycle of rebirth and death, reincarnation. So we have an etymological thread between the Aurora Borealis and the Yure or Bore. We observe the most famous depiction of a Yure revealing the link between Saturn, the Black Sun, Father Time, and birth and death itself. It is perhaps this process of reincarnation which has created shadows in a subconscious mechanism of projection. Maybe the cycle of samsara ends when the shadows are dealt with like Samara coming out of the well to be seen. It seems so, the feminine spirit which terrorizes through her own misery as a form of reclamation. This is a trope in mythology when it comes to characters like Sophia and Nana and Lilith. Who is Lilith? 